friends, colleagues and listeners, good morning. Nice little podcast ahead of us now with uh, Henry Gambach, who everybody knows and knows very well. And uh, also due to the fact that Henrik is going to become the new chairman, taking over from Des Fatanis of the ACHL and the combined conference, uh, which includes ASA, ULD Care and uh, Pharma Perishable. So, Henrik, lovely to speak to you again, my friend. Good to see you again, Chris. Yeah. Happy to join. You're always in demand. Wow, that, that is perhaps an exaggeration. But, uh, but uh, of course, I was very, you can say, humbled and, and happy when Pauline asked if I would uh, consider take over after this. Um, and so uh, I'm happy that I'm going to join you next year. Yeah, no, it's always good. It's a, ni- it's a nice legacy. I remember when I was chairman and poor old Des had a huge task um, to consider. And now, obviously, that's added a little bit of weight to the rucksack on your shoulders now, Henrik. So looking forward to what you're going to bring to it next year and there on. Well, first of all, I can express my biggest respect for both the work you and Des have done. But that's also one of the reasons why it's actually a, a function that you would consider taking on uh, now that I later in this year go into retirement and no longer have an ambition of, of full-time work. But uh, ACHL have always been good. I like in the, the combination of having a conference. Actually, you have several conferences at the same time. Yeah. You have an exhibition. And then you have the speed dating, if I can use that term, where you have the, the organized ability to meet up with business partners. This combination uh, makes it for us, or has always been made it a, a very um, uh, beneficial place to go. And therefore, we typically go with a bigger team that goes for different purposes. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, happy, very happy to help take this uh, to the next level. Yeah, and that's that's something that, um, that that we experience. The fact that you've got so many different so many different types of conference within the conference and the exhibition, you get a much much bigger and broader audience because they can see the value that it brings by you know by just going to one event. Now, on that, Henrik, one of the things that we spoke about after the last one, and and we can discuss now is. You know, perhaps, and to be fair to some of the people who come and, and um, you know, they, they turn up as speakers or panellists, to be fair to them and also to the audience and to put things in priority, I think one of the things that we're going to do next year is we're not going to have so many afternoon sessions where people are expected to be in the conference room listening to panellists and speakers. And and I think that will work better. What, what, what are your feelings on that one? I, mean, I totally agree. I mean, <laughs> actually, it's a success. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say now, but it's actually a success that people were there, not there in the afternoon, because they're outside doing business. Yeah. So you go to a conference like this, not, not as you can say company paid vacation, you go there to do something that furthers what you're doing business-wise. So all the time you spend interacting with other people is beneficial, which then drags you out of the conference room. So, yes, I agree with you, and, and, and as discussed for, for next year's version, it is probably going to be more an issue of morning conferences and then in the afternoon time for, for exhibition and uh, one-to-one interaction. Yeah, yeah. And I think what that will do as well is it will concentrate the focus on, on you know, real dynamic panellists and topics to be discussed. And also, dare I say, you know, a few presentations on, you know, on something that, that's, that's um, you know, that everybody would like to witness or experience. Absolutely. And I would also hope, I mean, now we have the pharma people on board, we have the ULD care, ASA as a core. I would hope that we could next year also extend and have further a track or a conference running in parallel. And, and one of the things you could dream about or think about is the trucking world. Yeah. Logistics is very much depending on trucking. A very large amount of air cargo shipments is also moved by truck. Yeah. There's a, a big interaction between airlines and ground handlers and the trucking community. So uh, one idea next year was could be to add a conference with a relevant trucking organization to also be part of, of the total mix. Yeah, no, to- totally agree, Henry. And an- an- another subject that we were speaking about earlier on in the year was also perhaps bringing the GSE um, side of it into into the uh, the overall mix as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And then also perhaps run a situation where you have these various meetings, but also that there is a place you can go at Gator Daily. You could say senior update. Yeah. ASA is doing that conference, which is good. 
But yeah. maybe that would also in the neutral middle conference be a, a, an hour or an hour and a half where senior ASA management comes and talk to the wider industry. So what has come out of the ASA conference? Well, guys, this is how ASA grows. Sorry, uh, this is how ASA looks. Look at it. So more of you can say you have the the conferences, but also an opportunity for the leaders of either of the conference to yeah. talk to everybody. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you, Henry. That's that's always a good one. That you get a couple of senior people or people who are really engaged or you know have got have got that that um that skill of making people interested. And if you can get them and then, you know, almost give a presentation and an interaction of what's going on, at least it keeps everybody informed and it helps them for the rest of the conference. Correct. Agreed. Yeah. Now, now something it is something and, and and I'm not not for one minute suggesting that one conference is better than the other, et cetera, et cetera. But the industry has seen the benefits of conferences and also the value of conferences. And dare I say, they're, they're, they're mushrooming and there's potentially too many. What, what 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 do you think on that? Well, I at least say you have to be selective because you also have a job to do. Um, but 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 uh, yes, there is many conferences, and and you can say some conferences, but all not all conferences are the same. I mean, as an airline manager like myself, I would of course always go to IATA's World Cargo Symposium. Typically, yeah. also linked up with a number of working groups, etc., that we work with other airlines, then linked to a conference. So. Good place to go. Air Cargo Europe, or dare I say Air Cargo World in Munich every second year, is also a good place to go. That is more a commercial forum than an operational forum, but yeah. still also a place with the right participants. And then ACHL in, in, in the fall. Uh, so you can say there's a number of conferences that at least for me as a professional has been important. And key part of this is also who else is coming? Yeah. Who is it I have a benefit of meeting? And that can either be potential customers, it can be suppliers, it can be talent hunting, because you also meet people in an um, in a relaxed environment where you can say the barriers are down, and you walk away and say that lady or that guy belong in our team. So, so next to selling and buying, you also have an opportunity to potentially meet some of your future, some of your future people. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point, and it's a. Uh... And it is a great opportunity as well to pitch the quality of the companies that are there, you know, to attract those people. Now, let, let me ask you another. Let me ask you another um, question. Now, now you've you've been to ACHL many times, and um, I mean, going way back. Um, like, what are the key areas of interest for you for next year? Okay, whereby you've got the opportunity to reflect now on all the things that you wanted in your previous position, um, but also. Um, you know, what you'd like to bring new and fresh uh, to next year? What, what would those areas be? Well, uh, we talked a little bit about already changing the agenda a little bit around. So that's more at the practical level with morning or morning, midday focus on conference, afternoon focus on, on interaction, exhibition yeah. and so forth. Yeah. At the practical level, at the content level, I think it is evident that there are some shifts going on in the logistics industry at the moment. This year, I had the, the pleasure of... of uh, of moderating a panel on exactly what direction are we heading with the airlines, with forwarders, with shipper, uh, with an airport, with with China as representing the e-commerce industry. And, and I think that conversation alone sparked a lot of things that needs to be picked up. Um, and so I think this whole, the modal shift is one thing that is going to be further in focus. That's also why I allowed myself to be forced to, to suggest that maybe the trucking component should yeah. come part more into this because it was very interesting to note that China in the way I understood Candy Chow in her statement was that well well airline is airline is airline what interests us is what happens on the ground yeah which just just makes the ACSL forum and come together of, of various people around what happens on the ground so even more important so this whole issue about integration of logistics on the ground I imagine becomes a focus and then, obviously, the whole sustainability discussion. Uh, we just had the EU passing uh, regulations from 2025. You must have, I think it is 2% of, of uh, SAF in any fuel you uplift in Europe. By 2030, it has to be 4 and then it, it is 6 and then it, it increases a percentage a year. So the legislators have picked up the, the baton, which they should, and put in place the, the regulation that can drive the development. So I would imagine that that sustainability becomes another issue 
that uh, we as a logistics sector need to continue to uh, to address uh, and relate ourselves to. We have seen that Maersk as a shipping company gone out big and huge uh, with sustainable ships as an agenda. So I think that is something we would also uh, be talking about. So these two would be for me two, at least two important items to continue. Yeah. And, and and also, Henrik, if I may, um, you know, this seem to be green principle, but not much to back it up. It's good also that, you know, that there's now rules and guidelines coming in as to what you have to be able to prove from a statement. And if you make a commitment to a certain period of time, you have to be able to back that up. I think that's so important because too many people are talking about a subject matter that with the greatest respect, they don't know enough about. Yeah, but you have, I mean, you have the whole issue of greenwashing. If you can use that term, uh, that 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 people would like to be seen doing something, but they are not, and that can be, if you look at it positively, it can be out of the best of will. Uh, let's, let's discount the negativity for a second. Just even if people want to, I think also as an industry and and ACHL can be one of those forums where we can share ideas and pass what is it that you actually do, yeah, uh, so that you actually do do something do. And not just talk about it. Uh, again, a good opportunity to share views, visions, and go away from a conference with an idea. And you asked earlier what for me was interesting in a conference or important. Well, it is also this feeling that you go away from the conference and say, hey, I actually picked up a good idea that I yeah. want to go home and do something about. That idea you have not gotten if you have been sitting back home in your comfortable office chair. Uh, you need to get out, meet with people, and interact. Because yep. that is where the imagination gets going, and you come home and say, well, hmm, "I actually thought about they do. I could let's do something here." Yeah, no, that's it. And then you, and like you said, when you meet certain people, you make a beeline from because you know you'll be able to find out exactly how they did it, what the problems were, and what the benefits of doing it in a certain way are. So I, I agree that the networking value is is immense, especially when it covers a cross section. Now that cross section, Henrik, um, airports. We need more airports there. Yes. And the airports are in, in you could say, an interesting development perspective. If you look at it in, in different parts of the world for different reasons, I mean, we addressed it this year. Uh, Amsterdam speaking clearly out about the challenges they have. Other European airports talking about parts of the same issues. In North America, you once in a while run into to capacity constraints, etc. So airports are critical players to this. Um, and of course, should also be more involved in these conversations, especially making sure that airports get away from focusing on what is more, what is the most money for me as an airport operator? Yeah. Is that a new parking house or is that a cargo area? And many airports today choose to build a new parking house because that generates revenue for the airport, whereas a logistics area generates revenue for the entire uh, society around yeah. the airport. Yeah, no, I agree. And talking about car parks and stuff, what a terrible, terrible incident at Luton Airport, huh? Not nice at mm -hmm. all. Sad, very sad. It's a shock, isn't it? And when when things like that happen, you know, I mean, obviously, the you know the the the, the root cause and everything. But when things like that happen, it, it should make everybody realise, you know, there but for the grace of God, so many things could be happening in our industry. We've got to be so much more aware of you know worst case scenarios and how you deal with them. Yes, and that's why you can say, if I can just say, it, you say safety remain a key issue for me. And you know that I have recently been arguing a lot about the way the ULD handling takes place. This is, yeah. I know, very low practical, but it's still, uh, you can say, horrifying to see how many places across the world where things are not done correctly and putting uh, people's lives in um, at risk, or at least their, their good health. Yeah. So, no. yes, we have yeah. a managerial responsibility to ensure that things are done correctly. No, no yeah. argument. Yeah, and I think people have got to start appreciating the difference between responsibility and accountability. And ICAO makes it very, very simple. One, you can delegate, the other you can't. And when yes, more people now are going to look across the whole chain and they're going to start analysing, you know, who trained who, what level of training was there, was it competence-based, who, you know, who maintained that piece of equipment, who fitted parts. There'll be a whole chain, especially from the insurers, as to who they can identify or allocate a certain proportion of blame to. Absolutely. No argue. I mean, uh, I can only say yes. Yeah. No, no. Good, good, good. Now, during the conference, there was um, there was um, one session, and I know you you were 
you were involved as well, where there was a lot of challenges reference quality service levels and, and, and the way those service levels are measured, you know, the metrics. And from a credibility perspective, Henrik, you know, I think, you know, people need to be a lot more transparent and show clarity of the storyline as to why they do certain things and how they do them. The, the short answer to that question is, is yes. Um, I had the opportunity. I mean, uh, there was a great discussion. And yeah. I had a great discussion afterwards with the gentleman that I was discussing with in, in the in the uh, conference also. Um, and there is a lot of interest out there. And that was the great storyline here. There's a lot of interest there in getting to further detail. The problem we have as a challenge we have as an industry is that the reality on ground, the practical conditions are very different in North America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, etc. And that means rulemaking that fits the world very difficult because there will always be a local app, ah, but here we do it a little bit different. Uh, so yes, I am I'm fully with you. And uh, thank God the quality drive is not going away, but only getting more important yeah. uh, for all of us. But but Henry, do, do you think people should be? Do you, do you think people should keep tolerating that? Yes, but or there's an exception or whatever. Surely, surely there should be principles that are the same everywhere. And then if people can't accommodate that for legitimate reasons, then they get a time frame and they get a stepped milestone, uh, you know, approach to get into where they should be within that acceptable mile frame, uh, milestone. Well, okay. If you forget for a moment safety, and we only talk, talk quality, because safety you can never discuss, right? But if you're only talking quality of service delivery, I mean, I also think we have to be realistic and remember that air cargo is not air cargo, but air cargo. <laughs> and what does that mean? That means that there are people which have different requirements and therefore also a different willingness to pay, yeah. which is completely, completely legitimate. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing wrong in saying I don't need it to be exactly there at 10 o'clock on Monday. I just need it there at the beginning of next week. And that's legitimate enough. And that would there would be different players who would be attractive to different uh, business needs. Even the same shipper or the same freight forwarder may have different shipments for which they would procure different services because they're different objectives. So yeah. this this idea that you have to put everything into one standard model, um, I think is a little bit challenging from the perspective that there are fundamentally different needs and different ways of doing it. And that I don't think we should be afraid of allowing because at the end, the customer knows what he wants uh, and he can then select. And again, as I mentioned, the same customer will once in a while use operator A for those shipments once in a while, use operator B for other shipments where the service versus cost perspective fits better. So my view is not so black and white. I think actually over the years, I've graded myself a multiple gray view on this, simply reflecting on, on the business needs, which we are all here to, uh, to, uh, to satisfy. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree most of it. My, my take on it is that everything has to be done in a certain way because that's the business we're in. And if that becomes a minimum expectation level and it's a line, if people don't want to come up to that level, that that's the minimum price level in, in my opinion. But if they want to go above it or they want to do something different, then they should pay for those differences. So you, you, you've got a product differentiation and a price scaling. So I agree with that. Um, but there needs to be transparency so that there's no confusion yeah. from the shipper to the consignee because as it goes through the various stages, you've then got somebody who wants who wants to have the full the full three course meal, but only pay for a starter. And right. I, somebody who, as you know, dessert, as you know, as you know, Chris, I have been enthusiastic about Cargo IQ from its beginning. I was even back in 1997 when I was still a ground handler. This allowed membership because in those days it was only for airlines and forwarders. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's also taking in uh, handlers. Thank God for that. It's also taking in truckers even better. And yeah. so I think there are industry drives out there to create that transparency and that you can say messaging standardization. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Is it a lot better than it used to be? Oh my God, yeah. yes. Yeah. Because yeah. when this started, you deliver, you handed over the cargo, it disappeared into a black box. You had no idea. 
You may have a promise, but you have zero knowledge whether it would turn up. It may turn up as promised. Perfect. It may work out exactly the way it was agreed, but you didn't know. Now we have reached a stage where for those uh, forwarders and airlines that have reached a certain level of, of integration with each other, but there's some good transparency of what's really happening and, and that you have real time. But is this perfect? And is this discussion we had on, on, on the, the, the in final definition of acceptance, which is what the, the discussion with, with the colleague Kai from CHI in, 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 in Germany was about. Um, well, of course, there is still room for improvement on clarifying those, those details. But again, there it becomes also very different from different parts of the world. Uh, how is acceptance done? Yeah. At what stage is it with or without security screening? How many hours ahead can you do it? In some places, it's forbidden because the warehouse has no space. In other places, it's actually seen by warehouse and the four and the airlines. Let's get it as early as possible. That's a benefit for us. So again, no, no, um, no uh, single rule in that sense. Really, at the detailed level, serves everybody simply because there's a difference in, from airport to airport or from from operator to operator. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I fully get that, and 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 like yourself, you know, I've I've travelled the world and I've seen some things that I would be frightened of, and I've seen some things that I think are fantastic, but but what I do feel is that it, it's it's the transparency, and if you're able to categorise those particular exceptions and be transparent, then it's important for downstream decision making, because then people are part of that decision rather than assuming that things are being done in a similar fashion everywhere. And I think it's yep. that transparency and clarity by identifying certain, or however you want to call it, categories or or whatever, mm -hmm. but that then defines the, the 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 business that you're entering in and the quality and the services that you should expect for the money you pay. Yes, and I can only, I mean, like I also did at the floor, I can only encourage people to join organisations like Cargo IQ and be part of defining this because it will not be one single person sitting in one company yeah. who defines this. It needs to be an industry come together or creating something. And I think Cargo IQ has come far down, far down the road of creating that. There's still room for improvement. Of course there is. And therefore, the more who join and enthusiastically contribute to the process, the better. It's easy enough to sit on the side and be negative about what doesn't work. I mean, that yeah. we can all figure out. Yeah. That's, even yeah. I can manage that one. But <laughs> where the real benefit or value comes is when people then go to the table, spend the hours and actually be part of creating uh, the, the solution that takes us to an even better situation. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree with you. And and irrespective of any criticisms or discussion or debate, like you said. But, but can, I also just say, can I just say, Chris, that afterwards I had the opportunity to write by accident and incident. No, not accident, by incident. <laughs> had the opportunity to ride from the hotel to the airport in Athens with, with Kai from CHI. And we actually had a great discussion uh, about the detailed issues he observed in German airports. Yeah. Which is, again is a good example of what I discussed before, that you might have industry-wide views on things, but then there are very specific views that needs to address to be addressed. And when you listen to Kai, what he was talking about, I can fully understand some of the challenges he think he has. Yeah. Or he has, not he think he some of the challenges he has. But in other countries, some of the challenges may look different. Yeah, uh, yeah. but I yeah. but I think it was very um, good to meet such an enthusiastic person. Oh yeah, no, Kai Kai certainly puts challenges out there, and and that's a good thing. Um, yeah. So you know, the more the more the more people who, who speak up and and like you said, then get involved. You know, yes. that's that's what the industry needs. What what I have little time for, Chris. I mean, just be clear about that. I have very little time for people who only blah blah blah. So talk, but don't walk. Yeah. Those who can only criticize, but then don't join to create, my life is too short. No, no, no. I remember I remember discussions we had many times in COAG and, and ICHC on that. So, yeah, no, fair play. Yeah. Henrik, you're a man who always gets involved. And I, I enjoyed every minute of our, of our working together. And I look forward to working with you in the future. I wish you well. I know you're going to make a big impact. And um, and I know Des Des is pleased to hand the baton over as well, as we all should be, because it's um, you know it's always good to to get new blood, new perspectives, new ideas on board. So looking forward to uh, working with you next year, wherever wherever it takes us, Henrik. 
I can only say I look very forward, much forward to work with you, Des, and the team. Um, ACHL has for many years been, for me, a very positive experience. I'm very, very happy that I was asked, humbled, and look forward to hope that we can make another good one next year. Yeah, yeah, please. I'm sure we will. All right, my friend, take care of yourself. Good luck. Let's keep in touch, and I know we'll uh, we'll be in touch uh, as the planning stages and the organisation gets underway. Absolutely. Take care. Yeah, thanks very much, Henrik.